Week 11 is here, and Week 11 has two quarterbacks at the top, and they face each other in Monday night football. Patrick Mahomes against the Philadelphia Eagles. On the road, Jalen Hurts against the Kansas City Chiefs. Hayden, before we got started here, I actually said, it's not just you, consensus rankings have Patrick Mahomes as the quarterback one. That that stood out to me as a bit of a shock, as a bit of a bold characteristic and take, because over the last two games before the bye week for Patrick Mahomes, quarterback 30, quarterback 12. So what gives you the confidence of putting Patrick Mahomes all the way up there as quarterback one? A lot of the elite quarterbacks are in tough matchups, and I think the Eagles defense is a relative easy matchup. They're bottom four against fantasy quarterbacks. They're league worst in passing EPA allowed. And then Andy Reid happens to be 21 and three coming off of the bye as well. So I think that we're going to see Patrick Mahomes. Hopefully they self scout and they figure out which wide receivers they want on the field. So I think that there's like actual areas of improvement for this offense coming out of the bye. And I just don't trust this Eagles secondary. They just placed the Kobe Dean kind of a coverage linebacker as well on injured reserve. And we just see Patrick Mahomes, the neutral pass rate spike up. And in close, important games like this one, I think this one means a lot to these players, just obviously Super Bowl rematch. You see these type of quarterbacks run around a little bit more. I can see Patrick Mahomes getting there. But I do think this is a relatively like flat week for quarterbacks. There's sometimes there's like elite quarterback, elite matchup, right. and easily the quarterback one. I don't see a clear number one right now. I'm going to be a bit of a Debbie Downer here. That's my job on the show okay. sometimes. Okay. And I'm going to bring up the 24 and a quarter team total that the Chiefs have in this game. And also add, according to our buddy Rich Rebar, the worksheet, the Chiefs have scored 42 and a half points below their implied team total this season. That is 30th in the NFL. So maybe we shouldn't connect what Vegas is thinking as much as we, I know, I mean, they, they are wrong and they have been wrong about the Kansas City Chiefs this season. Let's put it that way. And it's not just them being wrong. The Chiefs have also done things incorrectly at times this year, too. You know where I'm going to go with this. So far this year, they've scored on just 25% of their drives in the second half of games, ahead of only the New England Patriots and the Arizona Cardinals this season. Um, I will say, the last two quarterbacks the Eagles faced, they've been Sam Howell and Dak Prescott, and those guys closed as the quarterback one overall and the quarterback two overall in any given week. So, yes, Mahomes being inside of the top 10 scores for fantasy in just two of his past six starts does stand out. Um, but as you said, the Eagles defense isn't quite as it was last year, where they're allowing 6.6 .6 yards per play on third downs this season, 31st in the league. So that third down conversion rate, if that sticks with the shorter passing for Patrick Mahomes and long sustained drives, he can find the end zone. Last year, Super Bowl, three passing touchdowns, his highest completion percentage in a place uh playoff game for Patrick Mahomes and added 44 rushing yards against, I would say a much better Philadelphia defense last year. Yeah. And the reason I brought up that third down stat is because the chiefs are averaging a league high 7.6 yards per play on third down. So keep note of that third down conversion rate when we get to Monday night football and also keep note of Hayden Winks quarterback too. That is Jalen hurts. Let's talk about, it. they are also coming out of a buy one of those rare performances. I think yep. where this happens um, in the super bowl, since you brought it up, the chiefs played man coverage on 36.4% of Jalen Hurts' dropbacks and blitz them on 36% of dropbacks. They're still playing around 32% of man coverage this year. And as we have talked about all season long, Jalen Hurts against man coverage via A.J. Brown has been one of the more unstoppable forces this season. It really has. They're going to need to figure out some of the passing game numbers because it's down just a little bit this year versus where it was last year. But like the Eagles... Coming out of the bye week, it's a first-time play caller in this offense. I'm hoping that they can make some adjustments going into the second half of the season. On top of that, Jalen Hurts, he was really hobbling around the last month of the year with, with the knee injury. Hopefully, he's coming back a little bit healthier because when I, I looked at just his quarterback design rushing yards, removing the sneaks, the sneaks are always going to be there for him, just zone read keepers, those type of things. He's only averaging 15 rushing yards per game, according to Sports Info Solutions. That's been up like at 15 and 30 yards per game in previous seasons. So hopefully, like I said with Mahomes, against a better defense, a really bad defense against the run, we see the rushing yardage go up from uh, Jalen Hurts, assuming that he is healthier out there. But the reason why he's not the number one is just because the Chiefs secondary has just been so good just this year in total. Their third in passing EPA allowed, their second and sack rate allowed. Meanwhile, Chiefs defense is 30th and rushing EPA allowed. So maybe it's a couple more 
designed runs for Jalen Hurts, and that actually keeps him in the mix. I can already hear the comments seething at your quarterback three. That is Lamar Jackson against the Cincinnati Bengals. And why might they be seething? Well, the last three weeks, the quarterback 26 overall, the quarterback 17 overall, the quarterback 18 overall, and Hayden, the Ravens have been scoring a good amount of points in almost every single one of those games. The part of the difference has been uh, the just rushing touchdowns have gone to Gus Bus instead of Lamar Jackson. Oh, I will yeah. say, yeah, right. That's that's helped us in some ways, but not for the <laughs> Lamar people uh, from 2019 to 2022. So like the peak of Lamar's prime, he was averaging seven quarterback designed runs per game. Those that led him to 48 rushing yards this year. That's five designed runs for 26. So it's almost like cut in half for him. That said, this month, the Ravens are actually passing the ball at a very high clip. Like typically they've been like this 40% range in neutral situations. The last couple months, it's all the way up to like actually like league average or above. It just hasn't translated to touchdowns yet. So when I looked into this matchup, the Bengals are 30th in success rate on defense. 30th. Yeah. They've forced some turnovers. They've gotten lucky in some very key spots. So like they're like EPA and like other numbers look fine, but on a play by play basis, the Bengals have been exposed, especially with chunk runs, which obviously is going to help Lamar Jackson. Yeah, chunk passes too. I mean, 12.5 yards per completed pass they are allowing so far this year. Wow. That's 31st in the NFL. Um, and they're also allowing 6.8 yards per play on first down, which is 31st in the league too. So, yeah, let's make it a Lamar week, you know? Hopefully. Let's do it. Okay. Your next quarterback, Josh Allen. New play caller, this time against the Jets defense, which has played admirably well this season. Your thoughts on this entire last week for Josh Allen and what it might mean here in week 11. I think it's hard to completely flip your offense in a week. Um, so I'm expecting like more or less the same type of stuff, especially since Joe Brady's been been there for a couple years now. Uh, I will say the Jets have played Josh Allen in particular very well. He's only averaging 206 passing yards with the four to five touchdown to interception ratio in his last four games against New York. Uh, those games, he has 58 rushing yards, three rushing TDs. So it's just been a little bit more improvised, scramble, kind of panicky. And that to me is what the Bills offense feels like right now. It's just like panics. It's still very good, but everything, the pressure and the panic, you I mean, kind of just like sense it. We, we, we get like that one week where they just control everything and like, oh, Gabe Davis is featured and you know, we're, we're playing quick ball and then it just like disappears and, and it goes away. So maybe a bit of the roller coaster, you know, from week to week and what is succeeding and what's not uh, played into this. But even in chaos, we know good things can happen with Josh Allen on top of that. Yeah, I'm expecting maybe a little bit more rushing than he's typically used to. But I think we're going to have six players in this potential quarterback one status up here. And your next name is actually Tua Tonga Vailoa, also coming off a of bye. This one against the Las Vegas Raiders. A 30 point team total for the Dolphins this week. 13 and a half point favorites here. Obviously, this is the highest team total. We're back at home. Everything's clicking for Miami. I have a trend for you just give to kind of get a feel for what's going on here. With Mike McDaniel, the 10 games where they face divisional opponents. He's averaging 6.3 yards per attempt, a 3.5 passing touchdown rate, which are both below average. In the 17 games not in the division, it's up to 8.6 yards per attempt in a 6.5 passing touchdown rate. So basically like double in the passing rate. My theory is teams that haven't faced this really unique defense or offense for in Miami struggle with like what the yeah. hell to do with it. The, the motions. And I think that's also why later in the season, the Dolphins have struggled compared to the beginning part because everything's so new. And then it takes some time to figure things out. Do we use the B word? The yeah, possibly. Word? I mean, a little, <laughs> a little bit. But my problem for the Raiders is they haven't faced Mike McDaniel yet. Yeah. You know, and they're going to the East Coast in Miami where Tua obviously tends to play a little bit better. So I think it's a great spot for Miami. They have one of the hardest strengths of schedule for the rest of the year, but I think this is a beautiful spot for Tua, the ground game, everybody here. And I think that it's just harder to face this offense if you haven't seen it before because it's it's basically not like any other offense in the league. Yeah. Reeves in the worksheet had some great stats actually about what the Raiders defense is doing well this season. They're playing okay. a lot of cover three, about 38% of passing snaps, 
which Tua has only thrown one touchdown on on thirty on eighty seven dropbacks, I should say, um, on throws twenty or more yards down the field, which I think it's Tua and Dak Prescott and um, C.J. Stroud in terms of most completions, twenty plus yards down the field. Um, the Raiders have allowed just seven of twenty nine of those to be completed. That's six in the league. Now, part of that is like you're talking about. What quarterbacks have they faced so far? Well, they faced Jordan Love, Mac Jones, Tyson Bajant, Tommy DeVito, and Zach Wilson. So I think those stats kind of come back down to earth a little bit here. And I actually hadn't wanted to bring up this because we always talk about not running on first down. Um, maybe that's the case if you're anyone but the Miami Dolphins because uh, they are among the league leaders in first down run rate. But it makes sense, too, when you're also your running game is quite different than anyone else's across the league, too. Some of these runs are end arounds to Tyree Kill or to like pitches to HM, which like doesn't feel like other people's ground game. And know? as you can see, among the cluster of teams that they are with, with the Falcons, the Texans, the Browns, and the Colts, those success rates are below league average. Uh, Miami just has their success rate the highest in the NFL. I like when you run away from the defenders, which those other teams are struggling <laughs> to, to figure out. Instead of running right at them. Yeah. Right at them. Who would have thought? <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's um, let's go to Dak Prescott. He's going to be the final one here as the potential quarterback one. He's obviously facing the Carolina Panthers defense, and he belongs here, Hayden, because over the last four games, Dak Prescott, the quarterback one, quarterback three, quarterback two, quarterback one in fantasy football this season, maybe with an implied total for the team of 26 and a half. Why is he all the way down as quarterback six? Just doesn't rush as much as the other guys, but I, that's why I said it's a very flat tier. You can make arguments for all these guys. I am with you. Dak Prescott's playing out of his mind. What's been interesting to me, look at recently. Yep. Coach McCarthy just saying, we're going to pass the ball all over the yard compared to what this like balance attack was. I think there's a couple things playing into that. One, Tony Pollard is not the same as what they had in their dynamic duo last year. And two, Brandon Cooks and Jake Ferguson are better than the wide receiver two in the tight end that they had last year. So I think Dak Prescott's going to continue to shine here. I think the matchup is totally fine. The Panthers have been good against fantasy quarterbacks, not because they have a good defense, because their offense is so shitty and their ground game uh, on defense is so bad that teams haven't had to pass a whole lot against Carolina. But we can see Dak Prescott like in totally. the first half have 250 passing yards and three touchdowns. So it's no surprise here. Yeah, I mean, this game opened at 10 the spread now is 10 and a half. Um, I've taken that. I've taken that in the Cowboys' favor. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just thinking about these two teams, how on earth do you think, like, it's not going to be, it's not going to be like what it was with the Giants last week? M maybe. It might be. <laughs> it could. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. But I, there's a lot of smart people. In fact, I think, like, 76% of the money is actually on the Panthers to cover this game. Just yeah, I mean, nutty to me. the half on a 10 and a half is a big deal. I, but I, I think I think Dak Prescott is playing at a really high level. Oh my like gosh. probably the best we've seen since like right before his injury. Most big time throws in the NFL this season. Third lowest rate of turnover worthy plays. Most tied with CJ Stroud on passes that have been completed 20 plus yards down the field. And they are putting, to me, the responsibility of explosive plays on his shoulders because mm -hmm. they can't do it in the running game. I mean, last year, I think that Tony Pollard, with a reduced rushing role, had something like 35 or, or 32 carries of 10-plus yards, and this year only has 10 of them, 10 of them mm -hmm. so far. Um, go watch the episode of Scheme I just did with Colt McCoy on, it's not just Dak Prescott, we'll talk about him tomorrow, C.D. Lamb. And the Dude. attention that he's still getting from defenses, and it really doesn't matter. There was one hilarious play where literally the middle linebacker ran to the number three wide receiver on the outside, which was CeeDee Lamb, because I'm sure Wink Martindale was like, we have to cover this guy and double him. And so he runs through two other pass catchers and goes to try to double him. Um, and again, as Hayden says, while it might have been a slow start with Brandon Cooks, that's working now. Mm -hmm. It might have been a slow start a little bit with Jake Ferguson. That's going now. And even like Michael Gallup's making some plays, Jalen Tolbert's making some plays. So like the double coverage esque stuff that we're getting to see Lamb is opening everything up for Dak Prescott and just like the pinpoint accuracy he has is unbelievable. Unbelievable. So okay. 
We'll start with a lock them in tier. Tier two, CJ Stroud is the next quarterback for you. This is against the Arizona Cardinals. Only difference between Stroud and Dak Prescott to me is the Cowboys are fifth in neutral pass rate. The Texans are 19th in that category. Obviously, the Cardinals defense, it's no bueno. I think that the Cardinals offense could actually keep up with Kyler Murray at this point. But yeah, Houston, third highest team total on the week of a 27. This is with a rookie quarterback. This is this is serious stuff. Nico Collins is expected back. I do think that does help. Um, but Noah Brown has been rock solid in his place here. So yeah, he's now number nine in fantasy points this year and the team totals high. So we should be treating him as a every week quarterback one, even if this is a little bit more balanced than we'd like. Yeah. To me, middle of the field throws are based on offensive scheme, right? Offensive play color. It's the structure. And just look at the top right cluster here. Uh, Tell me if you've come from a Shanahan McVay tree or not. Yeah. Uh, we have Kyle. We have Slowick. We have Kevin O'Connell. Um, even here, we have Mike McDaniel. And then it's just Ben Johnson up here with just a bunch of other dudes, too. So, I mean, yeah. these guys like to attack the area that you always call the most efficient in the league. And they know how to dial it up. Like, if you go back and watch, so you made some unbelievable plays last week. And then Bobby Slowick made some unbelievable plays, too, where dudes are literally having five or 10 yards of separation on mm -hmm. crossing routes, mm -hmm. 20, 25, 30 yards down the field. It's fantastic stuff. It just sucks that it seems like right now it is up in the air if Noah Brown is going to play, but we'll cover that on Friday. I remember the last like couple off seasons, it was like, oh, have you had like lunch with Sean McVay or Kyle Shanahan? And like <laughs> people were getting dragged because those were getting the head coaching jobs. Well, it turns out pretty good strategy. Turns out pretty good strategy. Even Zach Taylor was one of those names and, uh, that one has worked out quite well for the mm -hmm. Cincinnati Bengals. Okay. By the way, the Cardinals are 28th in the league in pressure rate. And so we've seen, we've seen CJ ball out even versus pressure. And if he's not getting pressured at all, along with his offensive line playing well, then he's just going to pick you apart. Yeah. And to hold on to the ball, like wait for that, that second level throw. Okay. Sam Howell is up next. No, excuse me. Justin Fields. Surprise. How should I forget the guy who is coming back into our lives, the fancy football universe, Justin Fields, at the Detroit Lions, the Vegas totals don't give a lot of optimism here, Hayden. 20, to, 20 and a quarter points, seven and a half point underdogs. Again, on the road, yes, in a dome. But you feel decent about this. I think the Lions are going to score a lot of points on Chicago. And I like Justin Fields um, trailing with the scrambles. In fact, he's had three games with over 130 rushing yards. Two of them came against this Detroit Lions defense just last year. We got confirmation that Justin Fields is like mostly healthy. He was at least a full participant on practice Wednesday. We like that. And we've seen dual threat quarterbacks give this Lions defense some trouble like Lamar Jackson. I'm not comparing Lamar to Justin Fields, but Lamar Jackson had like one of the all time fantasy games of the year just not too long ago against Detroit. I think that Detroit, their numbers have been OK. I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with that, like just because they're missing a lot of players uh, in the back half. So. Hopefully, Justin Fields with a much improved offensive line now that he's got DJ Moore with the explosives. I'm expecting for the second half of the season to have the best Justin Fields passing numbers we've seen oh. throughout his career, assuming his thumb's healthy. And right now, we at least have the full practice to go off of. You know where I'm always going to go to with Justin Fields, and it's how he handles pressure and his decisions off of that. The Lions are fourth in the NFL in pressure rate this season. And under pressure, Fields has completed just 48% of his passes for five yards per attempt. So maybe that is something that has been fixed. Maybe the offensive line has gotten a bit better with Tyson Bajant mm -hmm. out there too. And also I think regression is probably going to hit the downfield passing that was so successful early right. in the season. Um, I'm a little nervous about this one, but I mean, it's a multi-week injury that we're coming back from, but I, I'm, I'm excited to see Justin Fields back in our lives as an NFL quarterback. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Okay, now we go to Sam Howell, one of the best, if not the best, fantasy story of this entire season this is against the new york giants defense nine and a half point favorites the commanders are this week with a team total at home of 23 and a half the giants defense just miserable like yep. it doesn't matter what they do they have a lot of man coverage they have not been able to rush the passer they're 31st in sack rate sam howell has been getting the ball a little bit quicker and i think that they just have the wide receivers to beat the secondary that's been really struggling this month, we have the Commanders, number one in neutral pass rate. Sam Howell is capable of rushing around just a little bit as well. So the thing I'm looking for is just, can he complete these deep passes? Because against 
man coverage, according to Sports Info Solutions. His average depth of target is more than 10 yards downfield. So we're going to see a lot of these potential splash plays. The difference between, like, to me, Howell and Fields is I'm not taking the Giants offense serious at all. I can see Justin Fields getting in, like, a little bit of a shootout with Detroit. I don't think the Giants are going to make this a shootout with the Commanders. Bien in a press conference, I think today, says he used to wear a hat that says run the damn ball. And now his strategy has flipped to pass first after working for Andy Reid so long. Um, I mean, that bears itself out with yeah. how the commanders have been so far <laughs> this season. It's uh, it's really, really cool to see kind of the development of Sam Howell. Hopefully, I can convince Colt to do an episode on him as we go forward. I mean, he has now been the quarterback 13 or higher eight times this season. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is consistency. Yeah, the consistency. volume is insane. And a big change, because actually one of his worst performances this year, statistically, was against this Giants team earlier. Um, in that game, he was sacked six times, right? In week seven, when they played, he was 10 of 21 with a 50% rating against the Blitz. And then now, it's felt like over the last few weeks, he's not getting sacked at all, and he's much better mm -hmm. against the Blitz. So again, this is almost, hey, week seven, you did not do well against this exact same thing, and now you are, and we get to see another example of it in week 11. All right. Okay. Do we end this tier or do we go to the next one? No, he he's in this tier for sure. Okay. Brock Purdy coming right at you. Brock Purdy, um, to me, it's as simple as Hayden. If the Bucks cannot pressure Brock Purdy, then they're screwed. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's he, exactly screwed. He, he's going to dice them up. And when you watch Todd Bowles' defense, they will consistently put like five men along the defensive line. That is almost their base personnel and try to rush the passer with that. And so that leaves even fewer pieces in the back half to cover. And that's why offenses facing Tampa Bay have passed the ball at the second highest rate in the league. This kind of surprised me. The 49ers are 12th in neutral pass rate right now. Like that's much higher than we saw with like the Jimmy G era. So they obviously trust Brock Purdy more, especially now that we have like Brandon Ayuk like taking that leap uh, against man coverage on top of it. So I think it's a really good matchup. For Brock Purdy at home, the team total is really high. I believe it's the fifth highest on the week here. So I think this is a great spot for Brock Purdy to have one of those super efficient games. His offense is now number one in total EPA and passing EPA uh, as well. So I'm with you. I don't think that Tampa is going to be able to cover these guys in isolation. For the season, he has now completed a league high 62.3% of his passes on throws 10 or more air guards on the field. The best passer in the league, 10 plus yards on the field, is Brock Purdy this season. Okay. I'm going to force Jared Goff into this tier two. Yes, of course. I mean, Jared Goff, this is a fantastic matchup against Chicago Bears defense. 27 and three quarters points, seven and a half point favorites here in the dome at home. Again, this one is pretty simple to me, Hayden. The Bears are dead last in the NFL at pressuring the quarterback. Uh, and when Jared Goff has time in the pocket, he will also dice you up. And last year we saw that they dropped 41 and 31 points on this defense. Jared Goff had solid days against those, uh, against the Bears and those ones. Uh, Bears 31st and passing EPA. I know they added Montez Sweat here, but I mean, come on. We know this defense is. <laughs> They've allowed um, six top 12 scoring quarterbacks this season already, this Bears defense. Uh, Jordan Love, Derek Carr, Russell Wilson, and Sam Howell were among them. Mm -hmm. So I will say the difference between Jared Goff, this team total is really high. I believe it's the second highest on the week is when they once they get inside like the the five yard line it's david montgomery and now jameer gibbs season right. unlike the other ones like at least jalen hurts runs it in himself right all like J jared goff just might be like top five in passing yards and like 15th in touchdowns yep very fair now we go to the next year and that leads with joe burrow um man where do we begin this is against the Baltimore Ravens defense and four games against a Mike McDonald led defense. Joe Burrow has thrown for just 5.8 yards per attempt and his 3.3% touchdown rate in those games is the second lowest against a Burrow opponent that mm -hmm. he's faced multiple times over the last two seasons. So, so far, Mike McDonald has Joe Burrow's number. He does. He doesn't have Marlon Humphrey this week, at least, but it is a short week on the road for Joe Burrow without T Higgins. And I just wanted to bring up this density chart again, just because you can see Joe Burrow, the lack of downfield passing attempts is very evident against like a, a lot of the best quarterbacks in the league. And it's just a little bit harder for him in this dink and dunk version of the offense to like become an elite 
quarterback. Now, to me, Joe Burrow still playing out of his totally. mind. Hopefully, Jamar Chase feels a little bit better after playing through that back injury last week. But obviously, the Ravens in basically every single category are top five uh, because of their defense. Even with Marlon Humphrey sideline, I still think it's a tough spot for Joe Burrow. So. I will say before Mike McDaniel got there back in this is back in 2021. Joe Burrow did have 525 passing yards and four touchdowns against Baltimore, but, I, but that I seemed like a big difference eras ago. That totally. was like back as like single high defense against Joe Burrow. Yeah. I think everyone knows how the Bengals offense is going to go. It's going to be dink and dunk. Try to outsmart Joe Burrow, and usually he gets the better of you, but just not to the same degree as the other guys. And for YouTube commenters, we know that he hit Trenton Irwin on an unbelievable pass down the field too. It was a honey hole shot. It was incredible. Um, to your point though, because I think you have him as quarterback 12 this week. Yeah. Um, there's only been one top score, top 12 score, I should say, allowed by the Ravens defense this season. Do you want to guess who it is at the quarterback position? You won't get it. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Josh Dobbs. <laughs> and on top of that, he added 8.6 rushing points. Right. So that's really... How he got there. I think, and this is according to Reeves, the legend and his worksheet. Um, in the last two seasons combined, I think the Ravens have only blitzed Joe Burrow on 11 total dropbacks. So they want him to, hey, pass it short and we're just going to gang tackle and uh, bring you to the ground and limit big plays. I think Jamar Chase, like just targets and receptions would be the things I'd be looking for for this week. There you go. Okay. Next up is Justin Herbert. In an equally, let's say, awkward spot yeah. at the Green Bay Packers. I mean, 23 and a half total on the road. I mean, if you just look at the opponent, you'd think that, oh, man, this is one of those Justin Herbert games. But then you read into it a bit more, at least to me, Hayden. Um, I don't know if there's anyone outside of Keenan Allen that they can count on to win. And Keenan Allen is even iffy for this game. It sounds like he's going to play, but right. certainly not 100%. Right. I think that the Packers dare teams to run the ball. They're number one in neutral run rate allowed on defense. And that's actually led Green Bay to being the third best fantasy defense against quarterbacks. They also play slow on offense. This is like a weird volume game to me for Justin Herbert. And then on top of that, Kellen Moore, we've talked about this before, but just wanted to rebring this up. Their neutral pass rates go up and down depending on the matchups, like against Tennessee and Minnesota, more uh, pass funnels. Those are the two as uh, two highest neutral pass rate games. And then against the Chiefs, who struggled against the run, that was one of their lowest neutral pass rate games. So the Packers have not been able to stop the run this season. I think that they might just lean it a little bit more of an Austin Eckler game. And I'm with you, Jess. The explosive plays, like Justin Herbert has to make like A-plus throws to get these guys open downfield if it's not uh, Keenan Allen right now. So... Just a tougher spot. I will say Green Bay's defense is still very injured in the secondary. I just I just don't see like a huge like fireworks show between these two offenses right now. Kyler Murray is your quarterback 14. Oops, I revealed the rest of the list. Excuse me. Uh, this is at the Houston Texans. Um, Houston has allowed a quarterback one score, so top 12, and four of the last five games. That includes Desmond Ritter, Derek Carr, Baker Mayfield, and Joe Burrow, part of me wants to try to convince you to move Kyler Murray to the top of this grouping. I'm open to it, certainly. My fear with Kyler, though, is them t removing him from like inside the one two yard line. I I'm going to miss those those opportunities for Kyler, though. He still did have his own read rushing touchdown. I think that this could be one of these shootout games. Like I, I thought I saw enough from Kyler Murray last week where you can kind of envision a game really popping up here. I thought his scrambling ability was strong, and then he just missed some throws, which yep. was kind of surprising to me. But uh, assuming that he can kind of fix those, I do think he has a chance to pop off. He had three quarterback design runs in his debut. Uh, in the last couple seasons, he's kind of been that three to four uh, designed run territory. So the one thing with Texans, though, they do have Derek Stingley back, and Will Anderson right now is absolutely popping off. So they at least have a found they at least have like star talent back on this uh defense for Houston. Okay, I'm forcing a quarterback 15 to this tier because uh Josh Dobbs is an electric factory. This is at the Denver Broncos. Again, Vegas not kind to the Vikings this week. Just 20 implied points, two and a half point underdogs here. Dare they forget Joshua Dobbs was the quarterback three last week. He has now put together four straight top 12 scoring weeks wow. on the season. 
Hayden. And that was including a time where he had a single day of practice in this Kevin O'Connell offense. Who knows? Maybe it even blossoms and grows and connects even more. I do not expect Justin Jefferson to play Mm -hmm. this week, but soon we might get a full onslaught of Joshua Dobbs plus Justin Jefferson plus Jordan Addison plus TJ Hawkinson. Pretty cool. When I said that this tier is very flat, like I, I'm with you. I think that includes Dobbs. Like I think all of these guys are like so similar. Obviously, Dobbs is going to run a lot, and I think that he's going to run a lot in Minnesota in particular, just because they allow him to scramble because they call way more pass attempts than what Arizona did in general. The Denver defense is way better now than it was previously, and I do worry about Jordan Addison against Patrick Sertan, um, but. It's just Josh Jobs making plays, you know, and I trust Kevin O'Connell. Like I was gonna, I had the same note. Like the Vikings quarterback is the third highest on a per game base. That includes wow. Dobbs and Kirk Cousins, QB three. Right That's now. amazing. So, Kev, KOC is the man. He is. We need to get him on the channel this summer. That is for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we always like to. And we're going along with this, but I always like to look at this show as like a just talk about the offense standpoint right. too. Uh, so let's now do that with this fourth tier and go to Geno Smith and Trevor Lawrence, who, yes, I would call it bottoming out a little bit. I know that Geno finally got there and it made sense when the matchup certainly dictated it, but this week against the Rams, it doesn't as much. He's being pressured on a season low 23% of dropbacks. Um, His previous low pressure rate was 34%. Yes, that was last week. And mm-hmm. so when he is not being pressured, he obviously plays well. That might be the case here against the Rams, Hayden. But I also, it's like what we talked about on Sunday night. I almost want to take what we got last week that included a 60-yard screen pass to Kenneth Walker and just run away and never have to play the Geno Smith right. card ever again this year. Yeah, I am I think he was a, a top borderline top five guy last week. So I'm with you. I thought that was a great matchup. This one, I think is fine enough The I think the Rams defense is not very good. They played better like on paper than what I think matches up with their talent, except my guy, Byron young. Remember him from the, the spreadsheet wars we had in the NFL draft process. He's a absolute baller next to Aaron Donald right now. But yeah, I'm with you. The, this offense has just been a little bit off off. Hopefully they get their right tackle back. And then with Trevor Lawrence, like, ESPN has um Did you know he was the quarterback 32 last week? There weren't even 32 teams that played last week. <laughs> That's tough. That is tough. Yeah, the, <laughs> I mean, it feels like that. The watching this often is kind of like with the Joe Burrow discussion. Where are the downfield targets? You just can't. Right. They're static. All your all your um Bryce Young takes feels very similar to what what's going on with Jacksonville right now and on top of that, according to ESPN analytics, Jaguars are 30th in pass block win rate. So it's just been struggle city for Trevor Lawrence. And there just hasn't been like a lot of like downfield opportunities. And when they are downfield, it's like downfield, like hoping like Calvin really like gets his feet in. Like that's, that's just asking for inconsistencies. Um, Just to go through that with shift and motion Panthers again are all the way at 29th. Jaguars are actually right around league average at, at 16. Um, But there's a whole bunch of other things like you're talking about where, they're running a dude as a clear out guy and not really factoring that in. Um, right. It sounds like there is an Arthur Smith esque peer pressure going on with Doug Peterson uh, this week being asked countlessly about Calvin Ridley and how to get him more and more wow. involved. Um, but at the same time, Doug Peterson isn't the one who's calling this offense and he's not the one who's, you know, throwing the football on top of that. So yeah. it's a press Taylor thing at the moment. Okay. Let's just close this out. Jordan Love, Russell Wilson, Matthew Stafford, Baker Mayfield, and Will Levis. Anything you want to say about these guys? My only comment would be Russell Wilson um, because he has not thrown for 200 yards since week four of the NFL season, but his touchdown rate is ludicrous. Um, And so the regression word might hit at some point. Minnesota is blitzing at the highest rate in the league at 49%-ish and against this blitz this season. Russell Wilson is 28th in the league in quarterback rating. Uh, He is 28th in the league in yards per attempt and has just one touchdown pass against the Blitz this year. Well, you might need to find yourself on a little Broncos under then because their team total is at 22 and a half. So, or I think it's just going to be like a bunch of like Cortland Sutton 50-50 balls. So I'll probably have Cortland Sutton with a pretty aggressive 
ranking for all the reasons you just mentioned. Um, my note was with Matthew Stafford. This is assuming that he's actually ready to go. To me, the Seattle's secondary is going to be very good over the course of the season. Okay. We've seen Devin Witherspoon make some like, cool plays already. And then with Baker Mayfield, their team total is now under 15 points. Like that seems like shocking to me. That's just like, I get it. The 49ers defense is so damn good. Baker Mayfield is due for some, some turnovers. Maybe we get a bunch of those right now, but 14 and played, three quarters points. He's played infinitely better than that. Like, like to me, it's like, he's like almost like playing like league average quarterback play this year. Like obviously he's getting pretty lucky. Maybe it's like quarterback 20 kind of range. In my opinion, for them to be projected 15 points seems a little bit off to me, but Okay, let's walk down narrative street. All right. Where did Baker Mayfield play football last year? Well, multiple spots, but for the vast majority of time, the Carolina Panthers. Where did the San Francisco 49ers defensive coordinator coach football last year? Mm. The Carolina Panthers. Okay. Boom. Okay. As soon as Steve Wicks took over as head coach, uh, they just kicked Baker Mayfield to yeah. the curb. So right. revenge. Uh, I mean, there might be multiple revenges here. Yeah. I think I think Baker wakes up with revenge on everybody, though. Uh, just quickly, because we won't talk about them with wide receivers tomorrow other than Adam Thielen. Um, if the Panthers get annihilated this week by the Dallas Cowboys, I think we might get some coaching news next week. Just uh, keep that one in mind. They will get annihilated. Breaking news. <laughs> and we might get some coaching news next week. Wow. that That's no information. Just reading Josh the Josh McCown leaves. back on the channel? Question no, mark? just, just re <laughs> reading the tea leaves of, okay. of, of what's going on over there right now. Right. Okay. Titans are good, Hayden. Um, yes, they are. I mean, I could put, let's say, eight Titans up in this top row right now. Part of me wants to. But we'll kick it off with the top two, Travis Kelsey and uh, TJ Hawkinson. Obviously, Kelsey's playing Monday night with a certain rock star in the crowd, apparently. And then TJ Hawkinson uh, did his best CD Lamb last week in terms of running routes at every single level of the field. And Joshua Dobbs just loves to throw it to the position. Yeah, we get Kelsey's parents meeting Taylor Swift's parents on Monday Night Football. There's no way Travis Kelsey's not going absolutely crazy for that one, especially with the Kobe Dean out. There's structural reasons why he would go off in the first place. TJ Hawkinson, the team total is like kind of mediocre, but he's had a 40% target share with Josh Dobbs. And then back in Arizona, Dobbs had a 31% target share to his tight ends. I agree with you. Justin Jefferson probably back in week 12. Not this week. That's what the initial reports suggested. So TJ Hawkinson is here. I do think it is somewhat insulting to put Hawkinson in the same tier as Travis Kelsey, but I'll allow it. I mean, is it insulting after what we've seen recently in this past week? That is pretty unbelievable stuff from TJ Hawkinson, who's really blossoming in Minnesota versus like a little stagnant growth, I would say, with the Detroit Lions at times. Okay, three through seven. This is another tier that we love to start right now. Mark Andrews. Don Kincaid, Dalton Schultz, Jake Ferguson, and Sam Laporta. I mean, just from a top-down view, Hayden, there are three players here that are either rookies or second year, and that's notable when talking about the tight end position. It seems like we have like a new generation of fantasy tight ends to, to pick from after losing a bunch of Hall of Famers in recent years. Uh, let's start with Mark Andrews, the old veteran for us. I think he's got a good chance to pop off against Cincinnati. First of all, the Bengals have allowed 70 plus yards to tight end ones in each of their last three games. And then Mark Andrews against Cincinnati has had a really strong game, 73 yards, 45 yards in a touchdown, 89 yards in a touchdown, 125 yards in a touchdown against them. And that was when Cincinnati had two very strong safeties. This year, they don't, and teams have been exploiting that. You said it was the 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 big explosives against Cincinnati. I do think that plays into losing both of your starting safeties this year. Mark Andrews, what's been interesting this year, the new offense, it's been more dink and dunk options to him, his career low in average depth of target, but I do think that they will scheme him open now that I see that the Ravens are passing the ball more often. So I think Mark Andrews in a beautiful spot in particular. Yeah, I mean... Dalton Schultz just carved up that Cincinnati Bengals defense. And a lot of it was just one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to create separation. And then also they did some really cool blocking stuff on top of that anyways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mark Andrews is, is a consistent figure. And what we've seen from Don Kincaid since, you know, Dawson Knox going down is a real focal point of, of the offense. And 
He's looked obviously his best and is a consistent piece of that for sure. And then, I mean, Jake Ferguson, we talked about it yesterday. The dude is top 10, uh, excuse me, number one in targets inside of the 10 yard line. And with how Dak is playing right now and how the running game isn't playing right now, I mean, nuts, nuts stuff that we're getting from Jake Ferguson, even after a slow start of the season. My notes just to clear it out Dalton Kincaid, the Jets have very good corners. They are worse against fantasy tight ends. They've allowed six tight ends, which is the most, or six touchdowns, two tight ends, which is the most. That helps Dalton Kincaid. Uh, the team total for the Texans is way up for Dalton Schultz. We like that. And then I'm with you. The Jake Ferguson, number one in expected touchdowns this season. And I think that he is a special player. So let's yeah. go. I did want to bring up the Texans here for a moment because they're getting Andrew Beck back, which is fine. I mean, he's he's more of a fullback. But how they are utilizing their personnel groupings is really impactful. I mean, again, we've talked about how many decent to great wide receivers they have shown this year. Their 11 personnel is just 25th in the league. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the multiple tight end usage that they have out there, where in 21 personnel, because Andrew Beck is considered that, their third highest in the league at 25%. They'll just, again, use personnel groupings to create mismatch advantages. I do wonder if Noah Brown misses this game, if we see a little bit more Dalton Schultz working over the middle of the field. Not saying 30 yards on the field that we've gotten from Noah Brown, but maybe gets even more involved than he has in recent weeks. And Sam Laporta had a sick block against Joey Bosa last week in one-on-one -on -one isolation. Like that from a rookie is sweet stuff. I will say with Laporta, he's now the tight end 10 in usage this month. And I fear that, like I said with Jared Goff, just because his ground game is going to really get going the rest of the year, that Sam Laporta's numbers could take a, a little bit of a step down. That said, like you should still be firing him up as like a mid-range tight end one. If you don't have one of these top seven guys, then we can throw like the a, next name up there. Okay. We'll yeah. throw George Kittle on there too. Mm -hmm. If you don't have one of these eight top eight guys and maybe Trey McBride. Okay. Top nine guys. Then things might get a bit wonky for you. Like, yes. Hey, and I had this conversation prior to going live where they're going to be someone in your league that might have George Kittle and Jake Ferguson or Mark Andrews plus Trey McBride. If that's the case, and you are on a weekly basis looking at Logan Thomas, David Njoku now without a different quarterback, Cole Komet, try to make this final week deal for that second tight end, especially the ones that have already had their buy. Uh, because again, to us, even with Zach Ertz potentially coming back and Dawson Knox potentially coming back at some point too, then to us, this top nine is a big separator at the tight end position. I just want to make the case for Trey McBride. 32% target share without Zach Ertz. If you remove that weird game with Clayton Toon, he's had 20.2 and then 8.6 expected half PPR points. We think that Kyler Murray is going to continue to target Trey McBride because Trey McBride is good. Like It's as simple as that. Like To me, he's like an alpha at the catch point and showing some legit yards after the catch ability. And I don't think that Michael Wilson or Rondale Moore are very good at this point and you think has a chance to get really frisky in fantasy. Okay, we'll just close out this tier then. Uh, Cole Kmet, David Njoku, and Evan Ingram. Anything you want to say about that group? Cole Kmet, 20% target share with Tyson Bajan, 19% with Justin Fields. I think the only difference is Justin Fields is more likely to hit Kmet down the seam. There might be a couple more big plays to be had, but Cole Kmet has been schemed up a couple times. Yep. Uh, he's definitely a focal point with... Mooney and the ghost of Chase Claypool and all those guys really not relevant in this offense. Well, David and Chase Claypool's not even on the roster anymore. So I said the ghost of him. He's out of there. Got it. David Njoku, I obviously going to Dorian Thompson Robinson is terrifying. I will say they are actually like dialing up more like tight end screens to Ninjoku than you'll see like throughout the rest of the league. And he's been so damn good on them. His, his like average depth of targets like only like three yards downfield. But so many of them are like actual designed uh, plays for him. So I don't think those are going to go away because they've been very effective. So I think on the scale of like, oh, shit, I have a backup quarterback. I think David Njoku might be able to survive a little bit more than others. And then with Evan Ingram, I think it's a very similar matchup as it was last week. The 49ers defense completely stopped him. The Titans also have a very similar defense. Good linebackers, good front seven. I think you're more likely to see just some 50-50 balls to the perimeter, obviously, where Evan Ingram does not get it done. 
your next three, Logan Thomas, Luke Musgrave, and we'll see what Michael Mayer does if he's going to continue to be a member of this offense. They did lose Jakob Johnson, their fullback. Oh. So maybe that's why Michael Mayer is playing more. They're going to yeah. pivot to two more two tight end sets, even with that last week, 67% target share. So I think for the dynasty community, you're just like looking for plays that we can break down and be like, this guy will be taking a Trey McBride leap next year. But Aiden O'Connell is just going to throw the ball to Jacobs and Adams. I think Pat Frymuth might come back in the next couple of weeks, but we know Kenny Pickett's not throwing over the middle of the field right now in the least. Okay, it's your time to shine, Hayden Winks. Um, scroll down real quick. Make sure the people – oh, you're already there. Look at that. Wow. Are, are, are we sure? Are we sure we're going to follow this, Hayden? I said this is the boldest Sicko's uh, recommendation of the year. It is Tyson Bajan. So, like, it, it, I mean, it's a bat fight between Bajan and Commanders without. I will say the Sickos chart does not know that Montez Sweat and Chase Young are not on the team, but they do know that Tyson Bajan and the Giants are only projected for 14 mean, points. See, this is even when the uh, formula and the charts don't know. By Tyson Bajan, you mean Tommy DeVito? Or, yeah, Tommy DeVito. <laughs> Tommy DeVito, which is even more in my favor. No, it, it's way worse because Tyson Bajan at least right. will throw it, not take sacks, right. and lowest intended air yards per attempt in the league. But for those not on the YouTube uh, streams and you're listening to a podcast, uh, Bills, Cowboys, Browns, Dolphins, Steelers, Lions, and Jacksonville, and the 49ers. Bro, Those are the teams. Micah Parsons is going to live in the Panthers' backfield. Like, what they've been doing, and actually what a huge trend in the NFL now is, is get your, hey, freak pass rusher and allow him to rush from any spot. And oftentimes that is right above the center's face. Yeah. And think about Bradley Bozeman trying to have to shut down Micah Parsons. Will we see... Andy Dalton for a snap, yes or no? I mean, there's always a chance in uh, tush push situations that Andy Dalton comes in. Mm -hmm. That is always that is always a possibility. Um, okay, that does it. We'll be back actually here with wide receivers tomorrow. Um, I hope you all enjoy the primetime games this week. My one favor to all of you, my one request: go and watch Scheme this week. Uh, it's a bit of a slow start on a Dak Prescott episode, but maybe it has perked up since we started recording this episode, but all of you that watch this, give Scheme a try. I've learned a lot from Colt yes. McCoy this season, and most notably, just quickly, what I thought was prime spread offense in the past in great passing games was to go from numbers to numbers with four or five pass catchers. And instead, what these smart, genius offensive minds now are doing are we're going to run condensed splits, force the defense to start off tight and then that opens up free access to all these other areas mm -hmm. so it's rather than spread out to start and then condense it's condensed to start and then spread it all out because it really gives you entire ovals of the field to attack and that are wide open when the defense can't get over there tell that to george pickens and calvin ridley please <laughs> they only they literally all have one direction to run no it's true i mean it it, it really is it really is amazing um yeah. It's a great separator in the NFL right now. Mm -hmm. That is for sure. Okay. That's going to do it. Thank you, Producer Weaves. Thank you to all of you. Up the villa. We will talk to y'all soon. See ya.